Brothers and sisters, welcome again tonight for our first Into the Deep sessions of 2021. We're very excited for the year ahead with many, many uh, speakers and presentations that have been prepared for you. So please continue to join us and what an exciting year 2021 will be. Though we're still in the midst of the pandemic, we have been gifted with the great initiative from our Holy Father of the celebration of both the year of St. Joseph and the year of the family. Uh, my name is Sister Angela Marie, and I'm, I'm the coordinator for adult faith formation and catechesis for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And with me tonight are our speakers, Father Nick Meisel and Dr. Nick Olkovich, and Raisa Jose and Sister Maria Sara Garcia also. So thank you for all of you for being here tonight and welcome to our Into the Deep session. Uh, our topic tonight is really the exploration of a beautiful document written by our Holy Father and uh, promulgated on October 3rd, 2020 on the feast, on the eve of the Feast of St. Francis. So tonight, Dr. Uh, Nick um, Olkovich and Father Nick Meisel will crack open this document for us. So hopefully some of you have been able to read it and I'm sure many of you have not had the chance. So what a wonderful opportunity to, to explore the documents together tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least one of our speakers. He has been uh, presenting a gospel series for us. So we uh, welcome again, Father Nick Meisel to the, tonight, a priest of the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Uh, Father studied scriptures from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome and currently teaches at Corpus Christi and St. Mark's College here in Vancouver. Father also teaches at our local seminary, Christ the King in Mission, and serves at different parishes and high school ministry. Uh, with him tonight is Dr. Nicholas Olkovich. Um, Dr. Olkovich also teaches at uh, St. Mark's College. He holds the Mary Ann Blondin Chair in Theology. Uh, Dr. Olkovich teaches the, in the areas of foundational, systematic, and pastoral theology. And he came to us about two and a half years ago, maybe three now, uh, from uh, the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto, where he previously taught and served as Director of Field Education and Pastoral Formation up to 19, uh, 2017. And his ongoing research um, focuses on Christianity's relationship to liberal democracy and on religious responses to our current populist movement. So welcome to both of you tonight and thank you for beginning to address for us Fratelli Tutti, this beautiful encyclical of our Holy Father. And obviously it is encyclical um, who, that speaks about fraternity and social friendship as becoming is becoming even more meaningful during this COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, erupted suddenly while the Holy Father was preparing the document and writing it. Um, and definitely this um, pandemic has shown very, very clearly that no one can face life in isolation. So what a wonderful opportunity for us to, to be able to learn more about this beautiful encyclical. So both Dr. Nick and Father Nick will be available for us at the end of their presentation to answer some questions that we might have in relation to the document. So before I pass it to the two of them, I'd like to begin with a prayer that is taken uh, from the document itself. It's actually one of the two prayers that the Holy Father has written um, that accompanies the document. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth in our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all peoples and nations on the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects and shared dreams. We pray this through Christ our Lord, amen. 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Nick and Dr. Nick, welcome and thank you for being here with us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, sister, and, and greetings to everybody at home. Thank you for this great invitation to share this very interesting and timely and cyclical and discuss this a bit this evening with you. So as we begin, I'd like to present some slides to look at. Excellent. So I have here an image I'd like to begin with to begin opening up this encyclical. Uh, this image here is taken from May 27th, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the situation was particularly dire and serious in Italy, Pope Francis led a prayer vigil. And I think probably a lot of us have memories of that scene, that prayer vigil. It was raining, it was dark, it was gloomy. The Pope was physically alone or nearly alone in St. Peter's Square, yet united with so many throughout the world in prayer, all throughout the church, imploring God for help, perseverance and hope. I think that for so many people, myself included, that prayer vigil from Pope Francis stands out as a spark of light in the darkness during this pandemic. Some months later, in October 2020, Pope Francis released the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which can be translated as, we are all brothers and sisters. In this document, Pope Francis has put into words, it seems, what was expressed by him in symbol during the March prayer vigil. Fratelli Tutti, this wonderful document, is meant to give light during a dark time. In response to the real challenges and sufferings of people, Pope Francis discerns what God is trying to teach us and how we should best move forward with hope in the midst of challenges. We'd like to do a few things this evening. So first I will present an overview of Fratelli Tutti. After this summary, I will unpack in more detail Pope Francis's wonderful reflection on the Good Samaritan parable, which is the second chapter of this encyclical. Since I teach the Bible, this portion of the encyclical has been of particular interest for me. Next, my colleague, Dr. Nick. Nick will present some reflections as a political theologian on Pope Francis's vision of politics. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis was inspired by an episode in the life of St. Francis. This was St. Francis's visit to Sultan Malik al Kamil in Egypt. For Pope Francis, this visit, undertaken at a time of crusade, demonstrated the breadth and grandeur of this saint's love, which sought to embrace everyone. Francis was also inspired to write this encyclical after his meeting with Grand Imam Ahmed al Tayeb. Fratelli Tutti takes up some of the themes found in the joint document that these two leaders signed in their meeting at Abu Dhabi. And now I'd like to summarize this encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which is divided into eight chapters. In chapter one, entitled Dark Clouds Over a Closed World, Francis lists trends that hinder the development of universal fraternity. These trends, which according to Pope Francis have been heightened by the COVID pandemic, include the following. A slowing in positive moves towards integration. A rise in aggressive nationalism. A globalism motivated by economic concerns, which often imposes the culture of the powerful on the weak a spreading of despair as a means of control in which hyperbole, extremism, and polarization have become political tools. Another trend is the throwaway culture in which some live well at others' expense. People thrown away include the unborn, the elderly, the poor, minority groups subjected to racism and religious persecution, women who often do not possess the same dignity and rights of men, trafficked persons, and refugees and migrants who experience increased levels of xenophobia. Pope Francis explains that certain aspects of digital communication hinder fraternity, making an analogy to ancient towns in which anything outside the walls was seen to be foreign and untrustworthy. Francis argues technology has raised new walls where my world is separated from other people who have different views. Media can block authentic relationships 
and at times can stoke social aggression. After having articulated various negative trends, in chapter two, A Stranger on the Road, Pope Francis allows the light of the gospel to pierce through the dark clouds. Here, Francis analyzes Jesus's parable of the Good Samaritan. In the remaining chapters, Pope Francis articulates the changes of attitude and actions we must take if we want to imitate the Good Samaritan. In chapter three, Envisaging and Engendering an Open World, Francis argues our hearts should be marked by a spirit of social friendship and universal fraternity. According to Pope Francis, social friendship is a love capable of transcending borders. Fraternity allows us to see all people, especially those on the peripheries, as part of the human family. In this, solidarity is of central importance. Discussing the social role of property, Francis promotes the Catholic teaching of the common destination of created goods. This holds that the world exists for everyone. And so, if one person lacks what is necessary to live with dignity, it is because another person is detaining it. Catholic tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute. The common use of created goods is the first principle while the right to private property can only be considered a secondary natural right derived from the principle of the universal destination of created goods. As a result, Francis explains, it is unacceptable that the mere place of one's birth or residence should result in his or her possessing fewer opportunities for a developed life. In chapter four, a heart open to the whole world. Pope Francis continues to illustrate the concrete applications of the parable of the Good Samaritan. When our neighbor happens to be an immigrant, Pope Francis argues it is necessary to create in people's countries of origin the necessary conditions for living a dignified life so that unnecessary migration may be avoided. Until this happens, however, Pope Francis explains we are obliged to respect the right of all individuals to find a place that meets their basic needs and those of their families. Migration involves reciprocal gifts as newly arriving people bring with them a way of life and culture that can enrich the countries they enter. In chapter five, A Better Kind of Politics, Pope Francis indicates how politics can be developed according to the principles of social friendship and fraternity. He discusses how exploitative forms of populism and liberalism lead to a lack of concern for the vulnerable. For Francis, the concept of charity incorporates both a personal concern and an institutional response. Politics itself needs to be shaped by social charity, which makes us love the common good and shows a preferential love to those in the greatest need. In chapter six of the encyclical, Dialogue and Friendship in Society, Pope Francis explains how dialogue is necessary for social fraternity and friendship. Dialogue is motivated by a desire to seek truth and the common good. It is rooted in reality and respects the viewpoints of others. Francis repeats his call, as he's often done, for a, counter, a culture of encounter in which differences coexist, complement, and reciprocally illuminate one another. In order to build this culture, Pope Francis stresses we need to rediscover kindness. In chapter seven, Pass of Renewed Encounter, Francis explains that to build peace in areas of conflict, three things are necessary, truth, justice, and mercy. Crimes must be recognized. The memory of victims must be honored. Ways that do not fuel anger or increase injustice must be found to stop oppression. Conflicts are to be resolved through dialogue and open, honest, and patient negotiation. Pope Francis stresses in this chapter that war and the death penalty 
are false answers that do not resolve the problems they are meant to solve and, and I quote, ultimately do no more than introduce new elements of destruction in the fabric of national and global society, unquote. When it comes to war, Francis argues, it is very difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of a just war. When it comes to the death penalty, Pope Francis explains that the death penalty is inadmissible and the church is firmly committed to calling for its abolition worldwide. Opposition to the death penalty, Francis argues, is part of our witness to human dignity. In chapter eight, the final chapter of the encyclical, entitled Religions at the Service of Fraternity in Our World, Pope Francis describes the role of religious cooperation in building fraternity. From their accumulated wisdom, religions benefit society and should not be excluded. Pope Francis stresses that violence has no basis in authentic religious convictions. Fratelli Tutti concludes with a prayer that invokes God's help in following the path laid out in the encyclical. Having summarized this encyclical, I would now like to unpack in further detail Pope Francis's analysis of the Good Samaritan parable. This is chapter two of the encyclical, which is a really central part of Pope Francis's encyclical. In this, in, in this interpretation of the parable, Pope Francis uh, argues we can probably understand the trends that we face in society and also it provides a way forward. I'd like to begin by reading this wonderful parable. It's taken from Luke chapter 10. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. For those familiar with the parable, the answer to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, seems rather obvious. However, the question, who is my neighbor, is a subject of lively debate throughout the Bible. The question is important because it touches on the subject of group identity. How is our community distinct from the rest of society? How do we treat those outside our community? These were important questions at the time of Jesus. These questions are central to Fratelli Tutti. Depending on the biblical text, various answers and perspectives are offered. On the one hand, some texts raise very strong boundaries between the community and outsiders. For example, Ezra and Nehemiah utterly forbid marrying someone outside the community. Shockingly, in the book of Joshua, 
we find consistent calls for the extermination of people outside the community. On the other hand, other texts in the Bible illustrate a greater desire to include people not from Israel. On the question of intermarriage, for example, Ruth portrays a far more accepting view. Numerous texts show a great concern for refugees dwelling among the community of Israel, Exodus 22, for example. The various works of wisdom literature, Proverbs or Sirach, show a great desire to integrate Greek culture. Finally, Isaiah chapter 66 conveys an inclusive communal vision in which all nations will become part of God's family. In responding to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? Jesus could have tapped into the biblical perspective of community that is more circumscribed, protective, and less universal. As Francis explains in Fratelli Tutti, in earlier Jewish traditions, the imperative to love and care for others appears to have been limited to relationships between members of the same nation. In answering the lawyer, however, Jesus gives a response that is in line with the more expansive and universal vision of how the community is to interact with others. My neighbor is everyone, especially those who are in need. In his response to the various trends he notes in chapter one, Pope Francis could have chosen to interpret these realities through the lens of biblical passages that encourage the church to raise walls to protect itself from the dangers and challenges of our world. Instead, Francis chose to highlight the parable of the Good Samaritan with its risky call for the church to go outside itself to the peripheries where we encounter the suffering and bind their wounds. I'd like now to highlight five lessons that Pope Francis draws from this parable that I think are particularly important. Lesson one, the love of neighbor knows no boundaries. We are called to help all people. It's significant that in the parable, the man who fell into the hands of robbers is anonymous. Jesus simply calls him a certain man. Since this man has been stripped of his clothes, there is no way to identify his religion or place of origin. He is simply a human being in need. Pope Francis explains that love does not care if a brother or sister in need comes from one place or another. Further, we are called to help those in need regardless of where we find them. Although the parable gives no indication of what motivated the priest and Levite not to help the man, we can speculate and interpreters have over time. Since they encountered the man outside the walls of Jerusalem, their home base, they possibly thought that it was not their responsibility to help him. The problem was not too close to home. The route from Jerusalem down to Jericho was notoriously dangerous. Perhaps the priest and Levite thought the man was suffering on account of his own mistakes. He was caught unprepared in a dangerous place. The second lesson. Belief in God and the worship of God are not enough to ensure that we are actually living in a way pleasing to God. Those who ignore the man in need were religious men, a priest and a Levite. True devotion to God opens our hearts to the needs of our brothers and sisters. In order to truly love God, this parable teaches us, we must love our neighbor, especially those in need. The third lesson, in promoting fraternity and social friendship, we find natural allies with people outside our faith tradition and often in places we least expect. Jesus' response to the lawyer is striking because it is not someone within the Jewish community who epitomizes what it means to truly love one's neighbor, but an outsider. Throughout the encyclical, especially in chapter 8, Francis stresses the need for different religions to collaborate. For Tutti is addressed to all people of goodwill. We should develop a heart open to all and seek to collaborate with all. As Pope Francis says rather provocatively, paradoxically, those who claim to be unbelievers can sometimes put God's will into practice better than believers. Lesson four. Showing true charity to our needy brothers and sisters 
cannot only be a personal initiative, but must involve an institutional response, employing all the resources that the institutions of an organized, free, creative society are capable of generating. As Pope Francis explains, even the Good Samaritan, for example, needed the help of a nearby inn that could provide the help that he was personally unable to offer. Charity cannot only be personal, but must also be political. The fifth lesson I would like to highlight is that this parable is constantly being replayed or retold in our world. And so Pope Francis encourages us that we must each and every one of us ask ourselves, which of the characters do I identify with? This parable therefore for Pope Francis is a powerful examination of conscience. Have I turned my back on the sufferings of others? Have I become accustomed to looking the other way? The parable encourages us to choose each day to imitate the good Samaritan and take responsibility for rebuilding our wounded world. According to Pope Francis, Jesus's parable encourages us to respond to the divisions, polarizations, and other challenges in our world with a vision of social friendship and fraternity that is universal and inclusive. The message of the Good Samaritan parable appears to resonate and inspire people today. In conclusion, I want to give one piece of completely unscientific evidence to back this up, to back up the fact that the parable of the Good Samaritan, it seems, resonates with many people today. Recently, a number of popular movies about Fred Rogers, also known as Mr. Rogers, have been released. For example, the 2018 documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, and the 2019 film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, featuring Tom Hanks. Both are highly rated on Rotten Tomatoes. Today, people are reconnecting with Mr. Rogers' message. In it, they perhaps perceive a balm capable of healing our divided world and wounded hearts. Many people are attracted to Mr. Rogers' message, even though they are unaware that this Presbyterian minister's neighborhood was inspired by the parable of the Good Samaritan and the question posed by the lawyer, who is my neighbor? Perhaps then it is not a stretch to suggest that in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis has proclaimed to all people of goodwill the familiar refrain of Fred Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? I'd like to now hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Nick, to please present on his part now. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Father Nick. Um, are you gonna, can you go to my first slide if you don't mind? Appreciate that, thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to see so many folks. I can't really see all of you. Um, well, I can't really see anybody other than Father Nick and he just went off, uh, off screen there. Um, as a political theologian, uh, I've been struck by uh, Francis's analysis of and response to our contemporary political climate. And I thought it might make sense for me to focus my reflections on Francis's account of uh, two prominent political pathologies and his constructive alternative. And so my presentation is not meant to be exhaustive, um, rather it's meant to highlight and connect some major themes in what I describe or call sort of Pope Francis's political theology. And you sort of see them on the screen there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two sort of categories on the left first, and then something about Pope Francis's uh, sort of response to the contemporary situation that we find ourselves in today. So first something about two major trends or challenges that hinder social friendship that pop up throughout the encyclical, but are the, but that are the subject really of an extended discussion in chapter five. Um, liberal individualism, right? What some people will simply label neoliberalism and exclusivist forms of populism. So I'm gonna say a little bit about both and, and Nick, you can go to the next slide, appreciate that. So something very briefly about liberal individualism. And I think we have a, a pretty good sense of this, right? I mean, we're sort of, this is a worldview we've in some sense um, drank in, so to speak, right? Uh, according to liberal individualism, human persons are by nature fundamentally self-interested and radically asocial. And you know, in, in his analysis, Francis connects neoliberalism's conception of the human person, this radically individualist conception of the human person, 
with what he elsewhere terms the culture of consumerism, right? And the culture of consumerism sort of, you know, pictures human nature in this sense, right? Human beings are driven by an insatiable desire to consume. The meaning of life is to be found in the things we possess. Happiness is, in a sense, all about our purchasing sort of power, right? And you can imagine that this conception of the human person inevitably breeds conflict and competition in society. Others can easily come to be viewed as potential obstacles that stand in the way of our personal satisfaction. Um, this harkens all the way back to sort of Thomas Hobbes, you know, his understanding of the state of nature and of uh, the war of all against all, right? From this perspective, in a sense, society is essentially reducible to a collection of selfish individuals who come together to protect their narrow sort of self-interest. I mean, it's captured in a, in a sort of unique way by Margaret Thatcher's very famous line that there's really no such thing as society. There's only individuals and I, and suppose, I suppose families for her other sort of intermediate associations. Um, the second point here, the liberal individualism's conception of the human person as homo economicus, right? reduces human reason to an instrumental form of rationality whose principal, if not sole focus, is generating what? Generating short-term economic growth. And Francis laments the way in which politics, uh, particularly you know, uh, in today's world, has been subordinated to the demands of finance and the economy, as well as the neoliberal fiction that fidelity to free market economics will solve social problems like inequality and the environmental sort of crisis. As Francis notes in several different places throughout the encyclical, the marketplace by itself cannot resolve every problem. The mere sum of individual interests is not capable of generating a better world for the human race. Economics, as a result for Francis, must be reoriented. It must be reoriented by a commitment to the broader common good. The final point here, and it's related to something that Father Nick has, has already said a little bit about. Francis describes, there, there's this, what goes along with this mindset, right? There's, he describes neoliberal globalization, right? The global spread of a culture of individualism, consumerism, and market efficiency. He describes that as a form of cultural colonization, right? And this is what this is where we sort of get the, the, the pejorative understanding of the term globalism in today's context, right? This pejorative form of globalism weakens the communitarian dimension of human life. It levels out differences and destroys the unique gifts of individuals and cultures. And the imposition of this model claims, ironically, right, to unify the world while it simultaneously divides persons and nations. And in practice, as Father Nick said, right, the expansion of neoliberalism's profit-based economic model has in practice benefited the rich and powerful while increasing inequality around the globe. We are still far, as Francis notes, and I love this line, from a globalization of the most basic human rights. That's the sort of first pathology that is that Francis sees as as being prominent and present in today's sort of contemporary sort of political context. The second, I want to say a little bit about a second here. A second major challenge that Francis speaks about in various places throughout the encyclical, and I'm talking here about the rise of, and this is something Father Nick nodded to already, the rise of exclusivist forms of populism or of resentful and xenophobic forms of nationalism that really have, in a certain sense, arisen in reaction to the excesses of liberal individualism. And so that there's sort of, there's a, yeah. There, according to Francis, these new forms of selfishness or local forms of narcissism, as he puts it, find expression in movements that define themselves against outsiders, right? In us versus them or we, they mentalities that scapegoat or exclude those who are different, especially migrants, as Father Nick noted, and religious minorities, right? Two groups who are perceived to be threats to the cultural integrity and economic success of nations around the world. Christians, as Francis rightly notes, are not immune to these trends. Certainly Christians are not immune to liberal individualism. 
Um, but Francis has a fair bit to say about the way in which Christians have fallen prey to this, th this type of populism, right? Uh, many appear, as he says, to be encouraged or even permitted by their faith to support movements that mistreat and demonize the other. Many Christians in, in North America and Europe and Western Europe, for example, seem to be, appear to be invested in what Samuel Huntington terms a clash of civilizations narrative that pits, for example, the Christian West against outsiders, especially Muslims. The second point here, Francis notes that these trends, this, you know, this sort of uh, exclusivist forms of populism, these trends are to a certain extent understandable. He talks about ancestral fears of the outsider and of the instinct for self-defense, right? In, in some sense, ethnocentrism is to some extent natural. Evolutionary pressures favored cooperation among group members in early human societies, as well as animosity towards those who are different. And this is what evolutionary biologists will term parochial or group, altru group altruism, pardon me, All right? And so that solidarity is, is a real thing, but it's in some sense limited. And Francis highlights how the ongoing migrant crisis, economic inequality, and the pandemic have reinforced these, as he puts it, primal reactions, leading people to withdraw into their own safety zones, to build walls, physical and metaphorical or psychological for self-preservation. He laments the fact that some politicians, politicians who remain nameless in the text, have sought to cultivate and exploit these trends for their own short-term political gain. In calling us to move beyond these limited forms of altruism, Francis notes that xenophobes have deluded themselves into thinking that if they close their doors to the outside, they can develop independently of others. And that really flies in the face of his claim, uh, you know, articulated in a very clear way, for example, in Laudato Si, that everything is interconnected, that everyone is interconnected. Uh, the final sort of, um, Nick, you can go to the next slide if you don't mind. According to Francis, these, these two mutually reinforcing trends, liberal individualism and exclusivist populism, have contributed to fragmentation, and disunity among people and between cultures, nations, and religions. Liberal individualism and uh, xenophobic forms of nationalism have weakened humankind's commitment to the common good of all. And Francis laments um, the way in which our sense of belonging to a single or common human family seems to be fading in the contemporary world. The dream of working together for justice and peace, he says, seems to be increasingly an outdated utopia. And in his work, in, 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 the, in, in the text, he, he ties the rise of both of these pathologies, both of these political pathologies, to what the, the, the Catholic and the Christian tradition terms concupiscence, a predisposition to individual and group selfishness, a propensity to be concerned only with myself, as in the case of liberal individualism, or with those who are close to me or who are like me, as in exclusivist forms of nationalism. And that there is a sense in which these inclinations conflict with, they suppress, and they distort the human person's natural orientation to relationship, to communion, and to love. More on that in a few seconds. Uh, Nick, please, the next slide, if you don't. He, he's so good at this. Um, as awful as it's been, and it's been a long 10 months, we're nearing the point where, you know, I, I recall going into lockdown, you know, second term last year, you know, it was March 16th, I believe. We're nearing 12 months at this point. As awful and as long as it's been, the COVID-19 crisis, Francis argues, has done us a service. It's done us a service by exposing our false securities. It's revealed the limitations of both neoliberal individualism and right-wing nationalism. The pandemic has momentarily revived the sense that we are part of a global community, that we are all in the same boat, that our lives are interwoven with and sustained by others in so many different ways. Healthcare workers, other essential workers in a variety of fields, those are just two that come to mind almost immediately. And there is a sense for Francis that, you know, once this crisis passes, and, and we all hope it does at some point soon, 
that our worst response, Francis argues, would be to double down on either of these two political sort of pathologies, on these two extremes. We can't just go back to normal, Francis argues. Normal wasn't working. We have an opportunity now, as he puts it, right, to rethink our styles of life, our relationships, the organization of our societies, and above all, the meaning of our existence, which is really the core of this. So I've said now something about Francis's analysis of two prominent political trends that distort and hinder our capacity for authentic fraternity. So what's the alternative? Where do we go from here? Father Nick has hinted at a lot of this already. I'd like to sort of draw together a couple of threads um, in, in, in describing what I would sort of call Pope Francis's sort of constructive response. In his call for social friendship and universal fraternity, Francis reiterates two central and interrelated elements of Catholic social teaching, both of which are denied or distorted by liberal individualism and right-wing populism. First, right, humans are by their nature social beings. We are made for relationship, made for communion, made for communion both vertically with God but also horizontally with all of humankind. We are ultimately most fulfilled, contrary to the culture of consumerism, we are, all, we are most fulfilled ultimately when we live in and cultivate right relationship with God and neighbor. That's the first sort of important piece of the puzzle in his response. The second, Francis highlights the inalienable dignity of each human person, regardless of origin, regardless of race, regardless of religion. This dignity is not created or invented by nat nation states, but is a function of being created in the image and likeness of God, of being loved by and destined for communion with God. And reference to the dignity of the human person, right, that's so foundational to Catholic social teaching and to, and to Francis's sort of uh, political theology um, is, is really the core of everything that he says that constructively in response. He notes time and time again, the world belongs to everyone. And we have an obligation to ensure that every person lives with dignity and has sufficient opportunities for integral development. And all of Francis's more specific and potentially controversial approaches to you know, a, a variety of particular issues, the rights of migrants and the duties of host nations, the right to property and its relationship to, as Father Nick said, the universal destination of created goods. His critique of the way in which uh, just war theory has been used to rationalize violence. His rejection of capital punishment. All of those more particular sort of positions are grounded in his appeal to the bedrock principle of human dignity. And respect for dignity, as Francis sees it, is central to the emergence of a politics that aspires to universal fraternity. The development of a global community of fraternity requires, as he puts it, a better kind of politics, which is really the, you know, the, the focus of chapter five in the encyclical. A politics that is not subordinated to economics, a politics that is not based on fear and exclusion. We're talking here about a politics that encourages and facilitates the participation of all in society that is at the service of human dignity, that is at the service of the long-term, long-range common good. And that last point is especially insightful, I think. So much of our current politics at both ends of the spectrum focuses on the immediate, the concretely practical, in ways that fail to examine possible long-range consequences or to set long-term goals. According to Francis, global society is suffering from grave structural deficiencies that cannot be resolved by piecemeal solutions or quick fixes. We need fundamental reform and major renewal. And only a healthy politics, as he puts it, is capable of overseeing this process, this process of reform. And the last point you see here on, the, on, the, on, this, on this slide, since everything and everyone is interdependent, Politics does not end at the level of the nation state. Francis takes some flack for this point, right? He's very clear. 
We need a global juridical and economic order which can increase and help guide international cooperation. Much as John the 23rd, uh, much as John the 23rd did in 1963's Pachamit Terrace, Francis is calling for a new network of international relations and for the reform and strengthening of international institutions in support of integral human development. Now, his call, and this is an interesting sort of point, his call for the reform and strengthening of international institutions leads many to the conclusion that Francis is a globalist. And his position on migration, I suppose, doesn't help on this front. But rewind to what I said earlier about globalism in the context of neoliberalism. Francis is very clear in this new encyclical that he isn't a globalist in the pejorative sense. He isn't calling for the imposition of a closed form of universalism, as he puts it, planned by a small group and presented as an ideal for the, for the sake of leveling, dominating, and plundering. He's consciously trying to walk a middle ground between the two extremes, between the two pathologies that I, I have introduced, between a one-dimensional uniformity, a cosmopolitanism, that seeks to eliminate all difference, and on the other hand, a localism that overemphasizes particularity, that which makes cultures and religions different and therefore potentially dangerous or threatening to one another. A healthy politics, a better politics, needs to hold together the aspiration to universal fraternity with respect for the distinctiveness of individual cultures and religions. And this middle ground finds especially clear expression in Francis's call for what he terms a culture of encounter. In a culture of encounter, cultivating, building, and nurturing relationships with others is not just something you talk about, it's a way of life. In a culture of encounter, persons are faithful to their own principles and their own commitments, but also open to different worldviews different cultures, different lifestyles, different religious traditions. But this respect for the other's point of view, their right to be themselves, what Francis terms in the encyclical a dialogic realism, it needs to go beyond mere tolerance. It needs to go beyond live and let live. I won't bother you if you don't bother me. Francis is calling for something significantly more than that. He's calling for dialogue as a form of gift exchange a form of gift exchange between members of different cultures and religions. Our differences, as he puts it, can be creative. None of us possess the whole truth, and hence all of us can learn from, be enriched by, encounter in dialogue with those who are different. In chapter five, uh, and Nick, you can go to the next slide if you don't mind. In chapter, in chapter five, Francis draws an interesting distinction between populism Right, which he, he sort of he gives it a sort of pejorative slant. He tends to associate that with exclusivist conceptions of community. And on the other hand, the concept of the people as a living and dynamic reality that's con that, that remains constantly open to a new synthesis through its ability to welcome and to integrate differences. So I, I, I'm quite enamored of that distinction. I think it's, it's quite good. It's quite good. Nick, do you mind just going to the next one? He, Francis also will use um, the image of a polyhedron to de depict a society that is able to do this well, right? It's not hard to recognize that this attitude or culture of encounter and dialogue is precisely that which is lacking in today's polarized political climate. It is in and through a process of mutual exchange, a shared search for truth and freedom and dialogue, that persons come to a consensus on certain non-negotiable ethical values that are essential to a better politics. It is in and through this same process that our understanding of the meaning, the scope, and the application of those values evolves and deepens over time. That's a very historically conscious account of the way in which human rights theory and practice can evolve and develop over time, always grounded in respect for human dignity. It's a very historically conscious uh, understanding of the way in which uh, human rights theory and practice develops. 
although human reason, and this is sort of the, the transition to, to my ending here. You guys have been very kind to be patient with both of us. Although human reason can discover the reality of human dignity and the call to communion that inspires ultimately this culture of encounter, the birth of a better politics, according to Francis, requires something more. In several spots in the encyclical, Francis highlights the role that the gift of God's love or charity plays in overcoming predispositions to individual or group selfishness and in making possible universal fraternity. There is a clear sense for Francis that horizontal love of neighbor is grounded in the experience of vertical communion with God. And Francis talks about social or political love in this context as a particular form of charity that motivates individuals and groups to work together for the common good of all, especially those most in need, right? Um, very much connected to the tradition's sort of preferential option for the poor. Political love reminds us that charity finds expression not only in close and intimate relationships, but also in macro relationships, social, economic, and political. We are called not only to respond to our neighbor on the side of the road, we're also called to work at transforming the social conditions that cause suffering in the first place. And Francis is hinting here at what contemporary theologians call social grace. Social grace is the flip side of what the Catholic tradition has termed social sin. Those structures and institutions that hinder integral human development. And in his discussion of love and forgiveness, and I think this is particularly rele relevant for today's climate, in his discussion of love and forgiveness, Francis reminds us that only love, grounded in the experience, right, of, of communion with God, only love can enable us to pursue justice without anger and to avoid the quest for revenge that marks so many pro uh, protest movements um, in today's uh, contemporary sort of context. In the final chapter, and this is what I'd like to end with, and then we can sort of open it up. In the final chapter on the role of religions in the cultivation of fraternity, Francis argues that different religions' shared commitment to love of God and neighbor has contributed greatly to a better politics animated by universal fraternity. As Christians, he says, our wellspring of human dignity and fraternity is found in Jesus Christ, and in the triune God, a communion of persons that is the model for society. Others, as Francis notes, drink from other sources. Charity impels us to embrace these differences, to build a culture of interreligious encounter and friendship, and to cooperate in service to the common good. Francis is making an important point here about the nature of, quote unquote, authentic religion in the final chapter. In his analysis of the parable, for example, Francis notes that there are only two kinds of people. Those who care for someone who is hurting and those who pass by. Those who love their neighbor and those who don't. As he puts it earlier in the, in the encyclical, the spiritual stature of a person's life is measured by love and not merely by adherence to the right doctrine. So that there's a prioritization here of orthopraxis, of right practice, rather than simply orthodoxy as right belief. And this allows Francis to claim that religious violence ultimately is a distortion of authentic religious convictions, but also that non-believers, for example, who love their neighbor and do so authentically, have already been touched by God's love, and that their love and concern for their neighbor is grounded in an experience of communion with the triune God. So those are just a few major themes. I've tried to give you a sense, tied together a number of different things to, to try to give you a sense of, at least as I see it, um, core elements of Pope Francis's political theology, two major political pathologies and elements of his constructive response. We have here for you uh, a series of questions. I suspect that we're also going to entertain uh, other questions from the audience. Um, some things to think about 
in general? Which of the various trends that hinder the development of universal fraternity articulated by Pope Francis strike you as particularly relevant? Are there trends that you might add? Did you gain any new insights from Francis's analysis of the parable of the Good Samaritan? How can this parable be lived out in your family, in your parish, in broader society, in your, in your community? More generally, how are you challenged to grow or change by Pope Francis's vision of social friendship and universal fraternity? And, you know, uh, I think more concretely, in a sense, how do our local churches form a culture of encounter and dialogue? Where, what are we doing really well in this respect? And what are some of the areas where we could improve? Um, I'll leave it at that. This is this is a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. And I, I, I don't know if uh, Father Nick wants to jump back in now as well. Yes, thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Nick and Father Nick, for your beautiful explanation of this encyclical. You definitely, in uh, less than an hour, have impacted for us and brought some wonderful questions and brought some clarity. Yes, there are some uh, questions that come in. Maybe I'll start with a few to begin. And um, the first one says, to a certain extent, Fratelli Tutti says the obvious to people of goodwill, but who is listening? The UN seems to be blowing in the wind. So what is happening out there and why are people not listening to a message that seems so obvious? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good point, right? Like who is listening? I, I think people are listening though. I. It, Pope Francis, especially during this pandemic, has kind of emerged as one of, I, uh, it seems, uh, a really well-respected leader in the world who is bringing this message of hope, able to point out in society, you know, the positive aspects, but also where we need to grow. So, yeah, I think the, the questioner is right that, okay, yeah, there's there's obviously challenges to have this heard, but it, it seems that in, in many quarters he is being, being listened to, I think. I, I don't know, um, Nick, you got... I mean, I think it's a great question. And, and and so thank you for that, Felix. I think it was Felix, right? Um, I'm a parishioner at St. Mark's as well. The, um, you know, I was just going to add to what Father Nick said. I mean, change is difficult. Reform is really difficult, especially when you're calling for something significantly more than merely tinkering with the status quo, which is essentially what Pope Francis is calling for. Um, and, you know, that that's, that, that's difficult, particularly when you have people who are, are very clearly benefiting from the status quo. Um, they don't want to change. And I think a lot of people feel as if, um, you know, on the ground, uh, where do they start? What can they possibly do? Those those of goodwill, for example, where do we start? How do we get involved? And I think, you know, in chapter five, when he's talking about a better politics and his emphasis on kindness, for example, in the way in which Father Nick mentioned, um, I mean, that, that's a pretty small starting point, but it's necessary. Um, and, you know, I, I think people can get frustrated um, at times when things don't change fast enough. Um, so it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated sort of, um, it's a complicated question. It's a great question. Um, you know, starting small, I think is essential. I think that's part of what Francis is arguing here. Um, and, and hopefully we're building, right. As, as we sort of, um, as we move out of the pandemic, ideally in the coming year, um, to transform the world, but we'll see. There are all sorts of different pressures, all sorts of different interests that don't want to see that happen. Very good. Another question that just came in, or a question and comment at the same time, is asking, do you know much about Dorothy Day and how her work, ministry, and vocation puts into practice fraternal love and through charity? Yeah. I, I, I... I think a wonderful example of someone who was living this in a very radical way, obviously, well before our time, right? But uh, I don't know if you probably would have more to say about Dorothy Day, Nick. I, you know, I wish I did. So I, I would say that, yeah, the Catholic worker movement in general is is a great sort of example of a lot of what we're sort of talking about here tonight. And um, I have a lot of friends in West Virginia, for example, who are um, engaged in the Catholic worker movement down there, and they would give me a really big it would give me a hard time that I don't have much more to say about that. But Dorothy Day, yeah, very clearly a witness to everything that I would say that Francis is um, advocating on behalf of in this encyclical. 
Um, excellent. And then we hear, can you please explain if Fratelli Tutti needs to be read as a secular document with suggestions on world peace through the Catholic perspective? I ask, he says, because the encyclical seems to focus on the end of goal of global fraternity, where the Catholic Church teaches the end goal is heaven. But can you explain how Fratelli Tutti calls us to heaven and to leave as saints? Right, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good question. And what really gives, I was trying to kind of highlight what, what is really the core of the encyclical is the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Pope Francis is analyzing trends and also developing action based on on the on the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's really the the core and the heart of this encyclical. And certainly, like Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God, you know, it extends into eternity, and you know, we're called to live with God forever. But this kingdom of God, we're also called to build up here and now, a kingdom marked by justice, a kingdom marked by peace basically the kind of world that God would want. So that's central to Jesus' message is that he came, you know, repent and believe the kingdom of God is here. It's come near and it's growing small. It's a mustard seed, but we are called to build it up, to develop it. And so that that's really yeah, central to our call, our mission as church, our, our mission of evangelization is to build up this kingdom of God, which uh, is having union with God here and now, but also union with neighbor and building up a world that is more just. So, uh, I think it's very much rooted in um, the call of the gospel, this encyclical. And it, it's very clear the way that it's laid out in a very beautiful way where he has okay, the challenges that he notices, but he's always interpreting these challenges and calling for action through the lens of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so that's that's really, for me anyway, at the heart of this encyclical is, is this parable from Jesus. I don't know if you have something to add there. Yeah, I mean, I, that was really good. And I was going to say, uh, Father Nick, that uh, some reference to the kingdom I, I, is certainly appropriate there. And I mean, what is what is the what is the kingdom as fully realized or consummated look like? Well, it looks like people living in, in right relationship with God and neighbor. And I think um, two additional things, I mean, very clear in the encyclical that, you know, the inseparability of love of God and neighbor, that one cannot really be in a love relationship with God if one does not love neighbor. Um, and, and that's the way in which, in, in, in one sense, we express um, and mediate God, God's love um, on a day-to-day -day sort of basis in and through the relationships that we cultivate at the horizontal level of human living. And I would, you know, the, the additional thing is to just be careful about, we don't want to sort of dichotomize the sacred and the secular either, um, you know, uh, to sort of say, well, there's a, a sacred goal here and then there's the secular world over here. In a sense, we live in one world that's touched by, um, you know, the, uh, God's love. And that the sort of secular world, quote unquote, beyond the sort of church or, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the world where we encounter and we mediate God's love. Um, and, and, and so I, I think it's an integrative vision, right, of the human person and of, of society um, that, that, that's not opposed to uh, the, the sort of eternal orientation uh, of the human person. Thank you to both of you. Another question asks, how can we interpret the quote from uh, Hosea, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, according to the notion of fraternity. I'm going to let the Bible guy go, but I could, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really good question. And it's good that the book of the prophet Hosea, especially is a prophet who is, prophets are always calling the people to a twofold conversion, conversion with respect to our relationship with God and with respect to our relationship with one another. And it's it's wonderful that, yeah, Hosea is highlighted because Hosea is one of those prophets um, from, yeah, before the exile already that's really calling people to live the covenant that means caring for those who are, you know, um, the poor, the widow, right, the stranger. You know, I, I mentioned Exodus, this, this incredible concern for the stranger and the sojourner that we find uh, in the covenant with that God made with Israel. So, yeah, I think that, that the that the prophet Hosea especially is a is a very relevant one for this encyclical. And like all prophets, like what Pope Francis is doing this encyclical as well is, yeah, um, a relationship with God, calling us to a right relationship with God and also with one another. Okay. 
Okay, here is one of our attendees says, uh, I keep encountering people in my life, usually good people, yet who are very much about their individual and personal rights. Despite repeated engagement of dialogue, arguments inevitably ensue. How does one impress the import of the concept of the common good on people who are so fiercely uncompromising? Do you want to take a stab at that one? Sure, I, I, I just want to make sure I have it up because it's a great question. Um, oh, that's Glalin. Yeah, there you go. I know. So that's another good question from somebody I know. Um, uh, all the questions have been great. So thank you for this. Um, I, I would say that, oh, I'm just trying to scroll back up so that I have that because they're they're coming back in as we talk here. Uh, or did it disappear now? No, it looks like it disappeared. Um, well, I mean, yeah, in a sense, I mean, it's, it's fairly clear, I think, that... Um, in uh, liberal individualism as a worldview, as a sort of a, a set of sort of presuppositions with respect to the nature of the human person in society are rampant. Um, I think it's just part of the air in which we sort of we breathe and, and we live and sort of operate. And, uh, you know, many Christians have sort of um, inhaled that as well. And, you know, we want to be careful around questions, I mean, especially during the pandemic, the relationship between personal rights and the rights of the community um, is, for example, to uh, worship. I mean, that's a that's a really tricky one. And, and how much of that is a reflection, perhaps, of uh, sort of a neoliberal sort of presuppositions? How much of that is uh, a legitimate concern? There's there's a lot going on there in terms of helping somebody to sort of connect with the call, you know, to, to care for the common good in a broader sort of sense. Um, in my own experience, I mean, it's two things. I mean, it's helping people connect with their natural desire for knowledge and value and ultimately for communion and love. I think that we all have that natural desire and to help people connect with that. Um, it's not necessarily the most easy, easy thing to do, but to help them realize that ultimately their happiness and that their fulfillment is a byproduct of living um, in fidelity to who they're called to be at their best and that they'll be stifled um, living in a sort of culture of consumerism, for example, and then also to help them connect with um, the presence of God's love in their life, to help them identify where the gift of God's love is present, the way in which it gives them a, a, a you know, a tiny little taste of whatever it is that they're sort of yearning for ultimately, and to be able to place that at the center of everything they do. Um, and, and, I mean, that's that's very existential, but I mean, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. I think it's a great question. I don't know, Nick, if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I, I think what you said there makes makes a lot of sense to me. And yeah, all we can do is kind of try to, to model that, to keep trying, to try to learn from the other. And yeah, that that slowly but surely God's grace can work in, in you know, both of our lives whenever we enter into these um, moments of, of dialogue and it can take time as well. And it's, yeah, it's it be very challenging. Encountering others too, right? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, uh, encountering others, um, meeting people who are different, listening to their stories, um, you know, broadening one's horizon in that sense, I, I think is super important. And not just as something that we should talk about, as Francis says, right, but something that we actually need to enact. Excellent. Um, this is sort of a comment and somewhat of a question. Um, one thing that is tough in terms of parish life and parish mission in living out social friendship, loving those in minorities, the dark past, those on the peripheries, is that in carrying out active social friendship, those already within the parish community can often be or feel forsaken or neglected by their parish priests or parish community, and the community within suffer. Can you speak of this potential consequence and how to live out authentic community so that people are either side in either side are loved loved well? Yeah, no, that's I think a great question. Um, of course, within every every parish community, we need to to love those people who are there as well. Of course, that we encounter people who are struggling, who are wounded within our parish family, and to show that love there, and as well that that love radiates out. If it's true, I think. But yeah, uh, I think we we need to have both, and and one feeds off the other. If a if um, yeah if a parish community is too inward looking only, then it's not. 
Yeah, it's, it, I think that the outward focus as well helps the community to grow and to be nurtured. Yeah, I think that's well said. I mean, I, I wouldn't add much more than to sort of say it's about, I think it's, it's, it's about expanding our circles of concern. Um, you know, authentic love and, and communion overflows, just as the Trinity overflows into human history um, to invite us into the love relationship that is the triune God. Um, I, I think uh, ultimately we have to do both. We have to care for those who are close to us, um, but be careful that that doesn't become a sort of us versus them mentality. Excellent. How can we cultivate a cultural encounter in a society that is so private, where privacy is so highly valued? Yeah, I think yeah, I was, I'm really struck in this encyclical also by Pope Francis's, he, he gives a bit of a critique of, um, yeah, could be like new technology, social media even. And he really calls us to encounter people, like really get back to basics to, to be in relationship with other people, to listen to them, to approach, yeah, sometimes he, he's arguing we approach conversations looking to win arguments, but to approach trying to learn from the other. So this, this, this idea that, yeah, people are a gift, everyone we encounter, and there's always something we can benefit from them, but like to really be, to be with the other, I think is important. And yeah, that sometimes, um, yeah, our, our media, or whether it's, you know, okay, like, uh, news media or social media as well can can sometimes hinder because it he makes that interesting and I tried to uh, mention it briefly an analogy to this ancient city where you have a walled city that okay whatever was within the wall is is good whatever is outside is foreign and to be feared or to be kept away and the same thing can happen with with different medias of various sorts so to get out and actually encounter and have conversations with people who are not just part of my group but who are yeah part of other other groups as well as to actually be with them yeah i mean the only thing i would add to that is um i think privacy is highly valued and mm -hmm. often you know when you make yourself vulnerable to others um it, it, that often is an invitation that people it startles some people at times you know what i mean but making yourself vulnerable um even in a everyday sort of interactions with somebody on the bus for example um, they're sort of, whoa, geez, you know, like um, that can really open something up. That can really open something up. And, and, and that may be one, one way to get in. And I think that's of a piece with Francis's call for sort of little actions at the everyday level of kindness. Uh, you're muted, sorry. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about community living and loving others. And the question is, how can we live this way with people who hold values with which we strongly uh, disagree, like abortion and euthanasia? Yeah, so I'll take a, yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tricky one, of course, right? But dialogue does not mean we're gonna agree with people all the time, right? But it does mean we try to listen, to try to see, you know, what is motivating people to, to present our viewpoint, you know, and stick firm with that. But also in these conversations, maybe to see that there is some common ground that we can work on, you know, to, to promote the common good, even though we're going to disagree sometimes on some very important things. And Pope Francis is clear about that. Like dialogue is not sort of just this leveling off of, like, as, as Dr. Nick was saying, like, okay, you know, you, you be you, right? Live and let live. That we have to be firm about what we believe, um, but at the same time to listen, to see where people are coming from, what motivates them, but also then to see where there's, even with people we disagree on, there, there must be some things that we can work together on. And that can be a starting point uh, down the road to, for, for further collaboration. I think that's really well said. And I, I, there's not much to, not much I would add to that, uh, Father Nick, other than to say that, um, you know, if dialogue is meant to be a gift exchange, um, that's not going to be always easy. Um, it's going to be challenging and, and it's sort of bi-directional in that sense. Um, you know, we, we are challenged um, to live, uh, you know, in, in a better sense as Christians by others. And, um, and, we, and we do the same to others. And, and that's complicated, particularly in a context and in a culture where we're so used to not being able to, to do that. Um, and, and that's a real challenge. And what efforts do you think are being done to teach and promote dialogue within the archdiocese? 
Yeah. Is that uh, Catherine Kelly? Another good question from uh, St. Mark's. I like that. But you, Nick, do you want to go first? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, Sister will probably have a have a better view of what 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 all is happening, but certainly there is. I mean, a big emphasis of this encyclical is on um, yeah the need for interreligious dialogue. So. I mean, there's some. I just something I just am more familiar with, as I've kind of, kind of been able to participate in that. So that's definitely happening. There's, I mean, we have, um, yeah. There is this, these great works the diocese done does to help uh, express that preferential option for the poorest among us, uh, whether it's the door is open or with, um, yeah. Many parishes throughout the diocese have have welcomed um, yeah, refugees or or immigrants coming in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I feel I feel sister would probably have a better, clearer idea. I, I mean, the schools I can think of. Yeah, the, I'm involved with a high school, but there's certainly a lot of um, yeah desire to to reach out to to get to know people to see you know for this social engagement. Um, I, I'm not sure, Nick. You yeah. have does anything come yeah. to mind or? I was just going to add to that, Nick. Yeah, the the ecumenical piece as well, and the interfaith piece. Um, uh, I'm on the Commission for Ecumenism and uh, Interfaith uh, Relations with some other people I, I suspect who are in the room, uh, in the Zoom room right now. Um, and, uh, you know, there's important work to be done on that level. There's there's local dialogues. I think there's things that are happening that folks probably don't know about. Um, the Multi-Faith Summit Council of British Columbia, they have a brand new website. Um, the Surrey uh, Multi-Faith Council, uh, if I'm getting that correct, Sherry Marcel, they're doing great work. There's lots of really good sort of things going on here in Metro Vancouver that um, we probably need to do a better job of uh, publicizing and, and getting out there, um, at least on the in, in terms of ecumenism and interfaith. And then, yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And the last few minutes, we'll also have Sister Maria Sara Garcia, our coordinator for social justice, and she'll share a few more things about the last question you you have posed or I have posed to you. And how about in relation to uh, truth and reconciliation? How does Fratelli Tutti shed light on reconciliation with First Nations? Yeah, I think that there's. I'm trying to remember which chapter that is. It's. I guess right after the chapter on dialogue, when it discusses dialogue in in really difficult situations, the necessity of it, and I think that chapter is, is very important for truth and reconciliation. That um, you know, real wrongs must be must must kind of be recognized. You know, um, those who have been harmed that they must be honored. And I think there's a lot of very practical. Um, uh, advice there that would shed a lot of light on on the truth and reconciliation the ongoing um, this need that we have here with with First Nations in in Vancouver. So that chapter I think has has a lot of, of important um, principles for us. And I'm looking at it right now, Nick. And it's actually um, I mean the one section that is particularly relevant I think for what you're talking about there. It begins in Article 236, the value and meaning of forgiveness and its role in in conflict sort of resolution, right? And I think the, that's another that's another important piece of the puzzle when we talk about how absent the gift of God's love um, as a motivating sort of factor, um, we'll never have real reconciliation. We'll never like it'll be a sort of you know this cycle of sort of mutual recrimination that never sort of ends. Um, it's sort of anger and revenge, and um, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. I think Nick's right to highlight that piece. Okay, very good. Thank you so very much. So we're just about at the end. There are several other questions. Are there any question in particular that the two of you, as you see them, you'd like to address to conclude uh, the evening together that you might want to go a little deeper? I know both of you are able to see them. If there is any there that you would like to use to conclude? There's some really good questions there. Really good mm -hmm. questions. All right, pick one, Doctor Nick. No, I'm gonna let Father. I'm gonna let Father no, Nick. Pick. I haven't actually been reading them. I, I, you haven't been reading them. No. <laughs> do, do you see one there? If you if you see one, maybe just pick one. I'm gonna let Sister pick. Go ahead, Sister. <laughs> they're they're all, all good. Right. There's two of them. I know there are very many and very good. Um, okay, I will pick this. Uh, 
I fail to see how the encyclical addresses the taming of cert certain right-wingers who, by a large, appear to have lost their godly ways in terms of humility, arrogance, and violence. Could you elucidate on a pragmatic approach for importing the Pope's key takeaways to such an arguably difficult audience as, say, the American right-wing conservatives and their left-wing counterparts? Hmm. Yeah, that's probably your area more there, but the, with, I mean, the, the, the populism, right? Is that, it seems to be the piece that they're pointing to. And yeah, I mean, I think too, because a lot of populist movements are motivated by, or, or claim to be motivated by Christian principles. Hopefully this encyclical can be a challenge directing us at the parable of the good Samaritan. And I was trying to point out that, yeah, that, that issue of, of community, like who is my neighbor? Jesus's answer is very radical. Because there were other traditions in in say the the in, in the old in the Bible that that he could have gone with you know more exclusivist traditions, and Jesus chose one that was very challenging, very opening. We're all our, our neighbor, and Pope Francis in responding to these challenges could have also chosen to tap into that tradition, but he didn't either, which is very important and quite bold. So hopefully, yeah, those groups that are are claiming some like Christian motivation, even if Catholics among them can, can, can um, hopefully be motivated by this, but I, I'm not sure you, this is more your area. I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's also massive, right? Like, I mean, there's so many different pieces there and it's difficult to, to be able to gauge what exactly uh, the questioner means by right-wing conservatives and, and left-wing part uh, counterparts, lots of different people consider all sorts of different things left-wing, particularly in the U S context. Um, I think the right wing sort of end of the sort of a populist spectrum is a little bit clearer. I think it's safe to say that um, there are Christians on both ends of that of that sort of spectrum um, who have distorted the gospel. Uh, and, you know, it's been sort of co-opted by other sort of uh, other sort of understandings of the nature of the human person and, and, and society. Um, and we need to do a much better job at helping people connect with who they're called to be at their best. Um, it's really a, a sort of, we've either sanitized the gospel or we distorted it. And the gospel is quite radical. Um, and this encyclical to, to think of, to think of how shocked, how shocked so many people were by this. It's Catholic social teaching. It's very clearly in the Bible. It's biblically sort of based. Um, and yet it's, it's shocking to so many folks who have either, as I say, I think a, a sanitized understanding of the gospel uh, and its demands, or uh, an entirely distorted, and, th and, that, and that's on both ends of the spectrum for different reasons and in different ways. It's a great question. I'd love to write a book. It's the book I want to write. So, it's a book that we'll love to read, Doctor Nick. So, thank you so much to both of you for being here with us tonight, for opening our eyes and hearts to this beautiful document, and for kind of unpacking it so we hopefully can go back and read it, take some time with it and pose some more questions and find some more information. Before uh, we end the night, a couple of more things I'd like to introduce in the aura of fraternal friendship and um, <laughs> Sister Maria Sierra Garcia, my sister, and she is the coordinator for social justice here at the Archdiocese and uh, she'd like to share with you some concrete ways in which you could begin to live Fratelli Tutti within our particular circumstances and context here in Vancouver. So Sister Maria Sarah, please. Thank you, Welcome. Sister Angela Marie. And uh, thank you so much, Father Nick and Dr. Nick. It was a wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, I just wanted to first start off acknowledging that the Archdiocese of Vancouver is on the lands belonging to the Musqueam, Squamish, and to Slail Watooth nations. And we're very grateful for that opportunity. Um, some of the possible, I just came up with a 10, these are just 10, and there are many possible ways to live out Fratelli Tutti in one's life, uh, trying to offer some practical uh, suggestions. Um, a uh, number of them are volunteering. Uh, Father Nick, you mentioned the door is open. Uh, that's a, that's a, an uh, opportunity in Vancouver. Uh, the door is open is a drop-in ministry that provides food, clothing, counseling, and 
shelter services and referrals. Um, another volunteer opportunity is with the St. Vincent de Paul Society in your area. Uh, the St. Vincent de Paul Society works through parishes. So your parish might have a St. Vincent de Paul Society or um, there maybe a, a neighboring parish might have one. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul helps all of those in need. Uh, they bring the love of Christ to serve the poor on a person-to-person -person basis. They pretty much try to respond to whatever needs they find as best they can. Uh, the volunteer, just volunteering at, at Catholic Charities Men's Hostel in Vancouver. Uh, they seek to model the caring and compassionate spirit of Jesus by providing shelter and care for transient and destitute men in downtown Vancouver. Uh, another volunteer opportunity is with Catholic Street Missionaries in Vancouver. Their mission is to bring the gospel message of God's love and hope to those on the fringes of society. They actually go out and minister to people on the streets. Another possibility is to participate in a spiritual care series training and then reach out to a vulnerable neighbor in need through phone calls, maybe during COVID-19 sidewalk visits, mowing the lawn, or if we ever get snow, shoveling snow, uh, going shopping for someone, uh, relating to, listening to, spending time with, checking in periodically uh, with your neighbors or someone you know who is um, experiencing isolation or loneliness. The Archdiocese is hoping to host the spiritual care series training for those who are interested in reaching out to others in their communities um, sometime in the next two or three months. So if you're interested in that, keep your, your eyes and ears open for that. Um, becoming an active member of Development and Peace, uh, Caritas Canada. Development and Peace promotes the support of impoverished uh, communities in the global south. And that's the, you know, all the area in, in the southern hemisphere of the world. That it, they try to support um, the vulnerable communities, uh, and that helps make all of us by participating that in that aware of the needs of other parts of the world. Um, pushing out of our comfort zones, uh, Father Nick and Dr. Nick mentioned kindness uh, a few times. In that thought, I invite you to identify a person or group of people with whom you're not completely comfortable being around. Uh, they're not part of your own comfort zone. Try to find a way to reach out to serve the person or persons without putting yourself in danger or inadvertently offending the other persons. Um, the idea is to grow in loving those who might be more challenging for you to love. And sometimes this can be done right next to where you are. This can be done at work, at home, in your local community. Uh, the idea is to, is to charitably enter into dialogue. That's one example. That's, that's just one example. Um, and, but that's a, that's a very possible way of pushing out of your comfort zone. Um, becoming active in working to bring about social change locally by becoming a member of a local action group such as Metro Vancouver Alliance. A number of the organizations that I've mentioned have been Catholic organizations. This one is not any particular uh, faith, but uh, the Archdiocese of Vancouver is a member of it, um, trying to bring about local action, uh, local change in, in our society. Volunteer with the Archdiocesan Migrant Ministry to offer support to migrant workers in your area. They help feed us. They help bring us the food that we eat. The Migrant Ministry of the Archdiocese reaches out to those recently arrived or temporarily living and working in Vancouver through pastoring, advocating, and seeking to meet their needs. Become active in addressing the environmental crisis, which affects all people in the world. Read or um, watch a summary of Laudato Si, Watch, there are videos out there um, and find ways to implement changes in your own lifestyle. You might be thinking, well, this is about Fratelli Tutti, not Laudato Si, but they're very, very closely connected. Um, if you 
take care of your common of our common home of of the world around you of the environment with the goal of helping all of our brothers and sisters around the world especially the most vulnerable what we're doing is we're we are entering into that that fraternity uh care for our brothers and sisters um you might feel inspired uh, to start a group in your parish or local community that works at implementing small long-term lifestyle changes that help bring healing to our common home. Um, I have prepared a document that Sister Angela Marie is going to send out to all of the participants um, and with, with many of these resources. You can just click on the link and it'll take you straight to their, their website or the document. Um, three possible ways of getting into Laudato Si, uh, go to the Global Catholic Climate Movement in Can of Canada. It's a resource for learning and becoming more active in living out and promoting care for the earth. Um, there's a wonderful video, one hour video called Banana Peels and Climate Change. And it offers uh, as part of it, a daily examine of how we are trying to make, bring changes in how we care for creation. Um, Father Haran, Daniel Haran uh, has a, a series of videos that help with understanding Laudato Si. So uh, these are just uh, um, on the tip of the iceberg of opportunities or possibilities of how you can live out Fratelli Tutti. Uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I do at the bottom of the document that sister will send you, there's my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me and love to enter into conversation with you. Thank you very much, Sister Maria Sierra, for adding those opportunities for us to implement within our lives and to better live the principles of Fratelli Tutti and Laudato Si, the principles of um, social justice as thought by the church and as, um, uh, as we learn it from Jesus himself. And so moving forward, we'll love to invite all of you for our next coming up events. Uh, the next Into the Deep session will be um, on, uh, will be very close actually to the Lenten season. It will be the Friday after uh, Ash Wednesday. So Dr. Michael Higgins, the president of St. Mark's and Corpus Christi College. Uh, so another wonderful figure from our local um, institution, St. Mark's and Corpus Christi. Dr. Michael will speak about the laity and the call to conversion, a Lenten reflection. Uh, please come back on Friday, February 26th at 7 p.m. And then next week, as anticipated before in our previous event, we uh, will be starting our Endow Faith Study for Women. There are about 70 women who have signed up so far. Registrations will close on Monday. So if there are women out there tonight and you would like to join us, it's a wonderful faith study, small group discussion and study of the encyclical God is Love written by Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus. It will be eight weeks, uh, eight sessions weekly on a Thursday, either in the morning or in the evening. So wonderful opportunity to, to grow in faith and to grow in community, to better understand our role as women and our feminine genius, the great gifts of womanhood. So please join us if you like. And for the rest of you, um, men or women who are not able to join us, please keep all, um, all the participants in your prayers. So thank you so very much. Father Nick will end uh, with a prayer for us, but I would like to extend my gratitude to our speakers tonight and for each one of you for attending. May God bless you. You thank too, you so sister. Much. Thanks so much for having us. Sorry, Father Nick. No, no, no problem. Thank you so Great much. To have you. And uh, I'll just conclude. I'm going to project the final prayer from this encyclical on the screen, and we can pray this prayer together. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, Trinity of love, from the profound Amen. communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel 
discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings of the abandoned and forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come, Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth, so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary, different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. And my may God bless us all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much.